dusty renegade context of white supremacy. Before we get started with uh, today's broadcast, I have a correction I need to make. Um, last week uh, on Tuesday, excuse me, last week on Wednesday, Wednesday, September 22nd, um, Michael Tassarian was on the broadcast. Um, a listener made some comments uh, on the specific page for that broadcast. Uh, in the comments, uh, the listeners alleged that Cree, counter-racist evolving engineer, uh, had dialed that program with Mr. Mr. Tassarian. Uh, the listener um, wrote that Cree had called the program and used the term mulatto. Um, the individual went on in their comments to explain what they think is incorrect about the use of the term mulatto and, you know, some other things. At any rate, um, the listener was incorrect. Uh, Cree counter-racist evolving engineer did not uh, dial in. She did not call for the Wednesday, September 22nd broadcast with Michael Tassarian. She did not use the term uh, mulatto uh, that day. Um, the Whoever put those comments in, I'm not putting the person's name out there because I don't want to make it, you know, a personal beef or anything, but uh, whoever put those comments uh, on the show page, uh, they were incorrect. Um, I contacted Cree. We discussed it. Uh, I have since deleted um, that particular comment, uh, Cree responded to it. If, you know, she, she just indicated that she did not call in, she didn't use the term. Uh, I left that comment there, but I deleted the comment, uh, that the listener made, uh, and I contacted that person, uh, directly and let them know that I deleted their comment and that they were incorrect, that Cree did not call that program. And I also suggested, um, in the spirit of correctness and constructiveness that that person contact Cree directly and uh, acknowledge the fact that they uh, were in error. Uh, I don't know if that's happened, but I did do all that. I, as I said, I have spoken with Cree. Um, this represents the tipping point for me. Uh, we picked up a lot of uh, new listeners um, this year and, and over the last couple months uh, in particular. Uh, I've said this before. I've been saying it since the beginning, but since we have a lot of new folks now, I'll, I'll make sure I say it again. And just as a reminder for folks who've been tuning in, uh, I have zero interest, zero interest uh, in feedback from people who listen to the context of white supremacy. Uh, I am still learning about racism and white supremacy, but I'm very confident in my understanding of racism and white supremacy and what I am attempting to do with this program. It might not be correct. It might not be constructive. Uh, I say regularly, uh, if you do not think the program is constructive and it might not be, invest your time and energy elsewhere. Uh, I have no regard at all for any of the comments, whether they're constructive, whether they're not constructive, whether people like the program or not, uh, I have no concern at all. Uh, and, in fact, if I had my druthers, um, I would disable all of the comments on the show page because um, what I think when I see that, uh, people just go in and, and there's some people, they leave five comments on the show page that day, what I think directly from Mr. Fuller's code book, great spectator. Non-white people in general, including people sometimes referred to as black. Explanation. The term great spectator generally means that black people and or Negroes are basically onlookers. It means that black people generally do not do anything of great and or significant value themselves by their own will, but for the most part, spend their time watching and waiting to see what white people will or will not do, and in this case, responding 
commenting on how other non-white people respond to racism, white supremacy. The term also means that under white supremacy, no non-white person does anything of significant value that is not started, supervised, and or endorsed by white persons. Great spectator. That is directly from Mr. Fuller's code book. That's what I think when I see people just uh, leaving their comments uh, about the program. Uh, I will request do not leave any comments on the show page anywhere on the page for the context of white supremacy. I don't care what you think. If you don't like the program, so what? If you like the program, so what? I am sure if you are a victim of racism, white supremacy, you can find a more constructive way to invest your time and energy than leaving your two cents on the show page for this program. I'm certain that not everyone will comply with my request, and that's cool, too, because my delete button still works, so I can take care of that. But again, my request, please do not leave any, any comments on this page. I don't care what you think. If you have guest suggestions, that's great. You can shoot them to me. But other than that, uh, this is not set up as a public forum for people to come and share their views about what they think uh, about the program or the guests or the host or anything else. If you would like to do that, the code.net, they have a great form. You can write all day, counter-racism.com. They have a form. If you Google racism forms, you'll find a ton of them. This is not one of those. I'm not interested in hearing what everybody thinks uh, about racism and white supremacy. I pick people that I'm interested in hearing from and invite them on the program. Hopefully we won't have to do this again. Thank you so much for tuning in to the broadcast. I hope it is a constructive investment of your time and energy. Now that we've got that out of the way, I will get our guest for today's program, and we will move forward. Context of white supremacy. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? Counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. The cows, Gusty Renegade, we are all ready to roll. Uh, our guest for today's program, um, I was informed about her work uh, through Henry Macko. Uh, he was what? with us, um, wow, it was a long time, uh, April, I believe. I think he was back way back in April uh, 2010. He was on the program and shared a lot of great information. He talked about uh, pornography and sublimation of homosexual activity, and he referenced uh, our guest for today's broadcast. And uh, I thought it would be great to have her on the program. Um, she has done a ton uh, of outstanding work. Uh, she is an author, lecturer, expert witness, scientist, researcher, and educator. Um, just some of the books that she's written, uh, The Kinsey Corruption an expose on the most influential scientist, in quotes, of our times. Uh, she also authored um, Kinsey, 
Crime and Consequences, uh, her most latest uh, publication, uh, Sexual Sabotage, How One Mad Scientist Unleashed a Plague of Corruption and Contagion on America. Um, really important information. Um, check out some of the images that are linked with the program, and I think you'll have a, a great appreciation uh, for the research that she's going to share with us for today's podcast. Uh, and check out her blog as well because she has a ton of articles, uh, excuse me, her website. Uh, it's linked. You can just click her name. It'll take you right to her website. Uh, our guest for today's program, uh, Dr. Judith Reisman. Dr. Reisman, are you with us? Yes, I am. I was just listening to all these nice things you're saying about me and feeling very flattered, you know. I mean, keep on. Fine. <laughs> we, uh, we are appreciative. Um, thankful that you could share a little bit of your uh, Tuesday evening with us. Um, outstanding research, and I think listeners will uh, they'll see what I'm talking about. Well-earned uh, compliments to begin the program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, could you share, I guess, a little bit of your uh, background information for folks who may not be familiar with your work? Yeah, well, sure. Um, I used to be uh, a, a very uh, welcome guest everywhere in the world because I used to be a songwriter and and uh, worked for CBS, ABC, NBC, and especially for PBS, which was at the time called Educational Television, ETV. I uh, worked for Captain Kangaroo for many years as uh, as a... Uh, performance artist, writer, um, producer of segments for his for that wonderful program, and um, from there became quite concerned about the way in which television was affecting children. Not from Captain, because we were pretty good on Captain. He was very careful. Yeah, no, no. He Bob Keeshan was very cautious about every word that was used on that program. But uh, but certainly because of much of the even even captain advertising, which he tried to really be careful about, but it was so you know sort of sugar uh, cereals and things like that. Oh, I'm gonna say you know I mean kids are now demanding things from their parents that are parent that their parents really uh, don't want to give them, and it's undermining their authority kind of. And so I kind of slipped into this whole area of television effects, went back to university to do my Ph.D., found out that uh, the data on television effects was already well established by the Surgeon General's report in 1973. It was just hidden from the public. Uh, thousands of research studies confirmed that uh, what you see affects who you are. Uh, big news, you know. And um, ended up uh, sort of slipping, slipping and sliding into the kind of research that was going to move me, move, change my life, really, um, looking at uh, Playboy magazine, which was at the time um, producing uh, child pornography in its cartoons, uh, very carefully developed over time from small black and white cartoons with little boys watching things to sexual things to uh, little girls to full color cartoons of little girls being sexually assaulted in fairy tale cartoons to photographs taken from foreign outcuts uh, in movies um, to uh, to American uh, photographic material allegedly of an artistic nature and it was incestuous and so on. So I ended up doing all that sort of thing. Sued was sued by Playboy in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Uh, for libel and slander because I said it was the biggest porno child pornographer back in the 19, early 1900s. And won my lawsuit against Playboy. Meantime, met, uh, up with the academic pedophile movement in a big conference in Wales, uh, at the British Psychological Association Conference on Love and Attraction. Got directed to the Kinsey research by a fellow who used to work, a psychologist who worked with Kinsey in Pomeroy. He told me one was a pedophile and the other one was a homosexual. I said, which is which? He said, read and discover. I did and found that uh, Kinsey uh, had influenced the world dramatically and definitely picked up his his uh, pamphlet here in Guess who? Hugh Hefner, who said he had read Kinsey, decided he shouldn't be a, a virgin anymore. He was in college like most guys were virgins in college back then. 
and uh, and would be Kinsey's pamphleteer, so he kicks off the pornography revolution. Kinsey had kicked off the sexual revolution. And everybody, please do get my book, the last one, Sexual Sabotage, because it's a lot more interesting and fascinating and frightening and explanatory than I am. And that's a kind of, you know, bird's eye look at it. Wow. <laughs> Hi. Wow. The book, again, uh, Sexual Sabotage, um, How One Mad Scientist Unleashed a Plague of Corruption and Contagion on America. Uh, it, it's linked. You can pick it up at her website or you can go to Amazon.com either way. Um, or World Net Daily, yeah. Can you say that one more time? WorldNetDaily.com. Uh, World Net Daily uh, published the book and it's definitely available on their website or actually in any bookstore, and it would be really nice if you go into your local bookstore and start demanding it too. So there you go. There you go. Um, we'll, we'll cover some of that information to uh, help motivate people why they should check that book out. Um, sure. Before we, I guess, get started, you I've seen your photograph. It's on your website. You're a white woman. Is that correct? I, I think the last time I looked, I, mean, okay. I live in Arizona. There's a lot of sun, but I still, I'm still i still pretty whitish. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, you already mentioned Mr. Kinsey. Um, mm-hmm. I guess what is the, the general perception of Mr. Kinsey, his work? How do people generally feel about him who have not read your work? Well, it depends. You know, I mean, at university level, um, most – Students are still exposed to Kinsey or his disciples. The whole field of human sexuality was based on Kinsey. There was no such field before he hit the hit the scene, as it were. Founded, I mean, being being funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. And uh, yeah, the the film Kinsey was big feature film uh, put out by uh, Fox Searchlight it was in uh, 2004. Yeah, it was 2004, I think, or three. I forgot. And uh, that was starring Liam Neeson, which gives you a good sense of what it was supposed to be because he's a big hero and a big, you know, in all his films. And so the idea is supposed to be that um, that Kinsey really was a little bit off, you know. I mean, he just wasn't quite your regular fella. Uh, it's admitted now that he was homosexual or bisexual. People vacillate one way or the other. He certainly was not a normal or straight um, but the idea that's been promoted by his defenders is that, that all of the bizarre things that he's accused of were only because, really, he was just trying to make the world more tolerant. It's that song, like, to make the world, uh, uh, you know, anyway. So he was trying to make the world more tolerant, and so he's just nice guy, um, and um, it just accidentally stepped into the sexuality business. And, of course, those are all lies. I mean, flat-out lies. And they're lies that are perpetrated because the entire field of sexology, all sex education and our sex laws have been gutted and redone and to, to reflect this mad, this psychopath. And, um, you know, when you base your sexual laws in a society and you imitate the sexual conduct of a sexual psychopath, you're going to have a lot of nutty people in the country, and that's what we've got all the way to the to the Pentagon right now, I guess most people are starting to become aware of the fact that the, they had found, admitted to 265 people at the Pentagon who were downloading child pornography. Wow. Wow. Yeah, those are the guys who are going to protect us and who are in charge of Department of Defense people, you know. I mean, <laughs> thank you very much. So, yeah, pornography is, is as we know, um, it's assaulting everybody. And when I'm dealing with any group of people, and now it includes males and females, you're going to find large percentage of those folks are going to stand there and find all kinds of excuses for what they do because they're already addicts, you know, addicted to pornography, and they're sliding and slippering and slishing down that road into really serious bad stuff, and it's destroying their lives. Hmm. So with, I guess, starting out with Alfred uh, Kinsey, uh, his book, uh, Sexual Behavior in the Human Male and then Sexual Behavior in the Human Female. Could you share a little bit about that with our listeners? 
Oh, sure. Well, 1948, just a few years after World War II, our guys are coming home. They fought and saved the world, including Europe, which seems to forget that very quickly, saved the world uh, from from tyranny, and, and they're traumatized, and they're trying to start their lives again and pick up where they left off. If they're, if they're physically okay, if they're emotionally okay, they've got a crack at it. They had no idea that they defeated the enemy abroad but couldn't defeat the enemy at home because they didn't know they were being sabotaged at home. So Kinsey arrives in 1948. Um, our guys are unable to deal with the lies he's creating. What he said was, oh, he did this big investigation, and really the average guy is a sex offender, he said. You know, 95% of our men, he said, are committing sex offenses, that um, that 50% of our women are engaged in, in uh, 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 fornication, that 85% of our men are engaged. These are all, uh, that's illegal, by the way, in the United States at the time. Uh, he said that 25% of our wives are had, had abortions. Uh, he said that um, 100% of children from birth are sexual and that they can have uh, perfectly wonderful sex lives if they do so, you know, with, with older people when they're very young, that... Um, that uh, uh, 69% of our guys are, are using uh, prostitutes, all sorts of things. That, and, of course, the 10 to 37% of American males have engaged in homosexual activity. Now, these were all lies, flat-out lies, because 87% of his population was self-selected. They were prisoners. They were 1,400 sex offenders. They were all deviant, for the most part. Very few normal people would answer him, and certainly no normal women did, so that he redefined wives as any woman who lived more than a year with a man and uh, had a large uh, prostitution population of females that he used to redefine his wives. I mean, the guy was a psychopath and a sadomasochistic one, and children were tortured for his research. Uh, children as babies, as young as two months of age, were sexually tortured for his research. And um, his research becomes the foundation for everything that people have been taught since in the United States of America. It's a blitzkrieg across every newspaper, his pictures on every magazine. Again, you're funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. That means that nobody really much has the nerve to come against you in the academic world. They all need your grants and that sort of thing. So, it, 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 he really was a mad scientist. He really did torture himself so badly. Um, his organs that he appears to have died from his abuse to his organs. Uh, orchitis was the disease that he had, which is a basically a venereal disease and also one that comes as a result of massive trauma. So this guy becomes the sex educator for the world. I mean, you know, we're going to have problems. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um. I guess I, I really wanted to make sure I scooped out uh, some of this information around the pedophilia and mm -hmm. the research that went into uh, his work. Uh, could you share a little bit about that, please? Sure. He's called the father of the pedophile movement by NAMBLA, the North American Band Lo Man Boy Love Association. They they had his picture on the website. I figure one of these days I'll pull it down because I keep talking about it. And they and there's a statement made by the head of NAMBLA saying that uh, boy love um, uh, gay gays and boy lovers uh, should hold Kinsey dear, his research dear, because uh, everything that he has done is the battle that we fight today. Uh, so. So Kinsey is the father of the pedophile movement. He's the father, obviously, of the, the sexual revolution. He is the father of the homosexual revolution. And within the pedophile world, uh, we're looking at least, at least, at minimum, and it's really so minimum, 317 infants and children, the youngest two months, as I said, uh, five months old, children being sexually molested around the clock by Kinsey's team and by Kinsey, apparently, hands-on, uh, children who fainted, children who had convulsions, children who wept, cried, screamed, I'm quoting Kinsey, and, uh, and who struck what he called their partner, that is the adult male who's raping these children. And, um, and you know, he said that the children enjoyed it. <laughs> now, I remember when I first read that in his book, 
I saw this guy's got to be a sadomasochistic pedophile, and indeed that is precisely the profile that he has. He himself fits, and he surrounded himself with similar aberrant, dysfunctional, uh, criminal, uh, criminal uh, pedophilia associated and, and bestiality associated people. I mean, this was a really, really whacked out bunch, and from that he gathered. Uh, some judges and some lawyers and um, others of like mind who then created what's called the American law, the um, ALI, American um, uh, uh, Institute, uh, well, the ALI, anyway, Model Penal Code, which came out of the American Bar Association, and that Model Penal Code gutted all of the laws that had been protecting women and children in the United States up to 1948 when he hit the scene. Are you wow. there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and and every attempt to investigate him has been thwarted. In 1954, there was a major congressional investigation of the philanthropies, and uh, they were supposed to investigate Kinsey's research, the congressman who headed the research project was threatened with having the project stop totaling his, his investigation killed if he dared to expose Kinsey's research. So he backed down. He didn't expose it. Uh, in 1995, we tried another investigation of the Kinsey research on children, again, on children. And all that was thwarted. We're, I'm, I'm working to try to get an investigation again. The American Legislative Exchange uh, council, which is a group of, of conservative um, legislators nationwide, uh, have have produced a. It's on my website, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, the, this part of it. Not everything. You got to go to the book and read it because you have to know what it says. But anyway, so there's uh, there's an attempt now to return to do an investigation if. You know, if the president apologized for for Tuskegee, and if the president apologized for the LSD experiments on our on our soldiers, we certainly should be getting an apology uh, for the sexual violence and and sexual assault done to these children, infants, and children. And we most certainly should be doing an investigation of this federally and state funded group, the Kinsey Institute, which now is still in action at Indiana University in Bloomington. Wow. wow. I'm, I want to make sure I give folks the uh, the website as well. Um, Dr. Reisman's website is drjudithreisman.org, and her last name, R-E-I-S-M-A-N. Dr. Oh, I, oh, I think it's .com, isn't it? Oh, maybe not. I don't know. I keep forgetting. It's one or the other. Oh. Uh, I'm looking at it right now. This is dot. Oh, is it org? Oh, I've been giving the wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Oh dear. Okay. Well, Thank you. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, I'll, I'll double check as we roll to make sure I'm, I'm not in error. Um, okay. So why not? I, I want to make sure the numbers for the children who were harmed. Mm. Uh, right. Right. Said minimum. Yeah, minimum. Minimum, minimum. minimum. It can be up to 2,035. We have one man who bragged that he raped 800 children, um, and this was a a guy who did some of the major research for uh, research, (laughs) some of the major uh, child abuse reporting for Kinsey. And then we also have a Nazi pedophile in Germany who uh, was corresponding with Kinsey and who Kinsey sent uh, letters to and so forth, and encouraged him to continue uh, raping children. Uh, told him that his work would all be used as part of the scientific data. So you, again, I cannot emphasize enough that this was an insane man, a, a sexual psychopath, a sadomasochistic sexual psychopath. He was a pornography addict. He was a homosexual, bisexual, whatever. Um, and uh, I've forgotten all the other things that he was involved in, but I think that'll do it for now. Wow. I in addition I was I was reading a lot of what you've written and I was also able to check out uh the documentary uh Secret History, Kinsey's Oh yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, which yeah. you made an appearance in. Um, oh, definitely. <laughs> and they they 
in that documentary, they, they also said that he engaged in sexual intercourse with his grandmother. Uh, oh, Mr. yeah, Kinsey. not not Kinsey. It was that man who raped the 800, the 800 children He they, that Kinsey relied on who had sex with his father, his grandmother, his grandfather, uh, you know, children in the family and neighbor children. And, and Kinsey interviewed this guy and never turned him in, of course, never turned him in. And when I wrote to the Kinsey Institute and I asked about where, where this was at the very beginning, back in the 80s, in 1981, I wrote and I said, you know, where did you get the children and what was the research protocol? The head of the Kinsey Institute, um, Paul Gebhardt at the time, wrote me back a very polite letter saying that uh, most of the children were, uh, you know, were experimented on by uh, you know, uh, various people, uh, you know, nursery schools gave them research and, and, and also by, um, by homosexual males who, uh, who did this to the children and used oral and manual techniques. And later on we found out for sure that these children also not only raped in that manner, but uh, they were also uh, raped uh, in, you know, sodomized, excuse me. But anyway, this is late at night, I know there aren't children out there, huh? Oh yeah, we adult broadcast. <laughs> right, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So so this this man is critical to everybody's life today. Um you, you know, all of our laws uh that were gutted, people very few people realized in nineteen forty eight seduction was against the law in the United States. It was a felony crime in California. Uh rape could get life in half our states. Uh, the other half were, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, capital punishment in half our states. The rest would give life. Uh, you're talking about uh, alienation of affection still being in place. The laws were there over time. In this country, of the United States of America, the laws were in place to protect women and children. And, and that was legitimate because our women in those years were reasonably vulnerable, were not sexually bizarre, as they have increasingly become, and um, and could be trusted for the most part. If a woman said she was raped, uh, most juries and most judges would believe her because virginity was a prized value, and the loss of one's virginity meant that one was really put in a very bad position in society. So, so very few women had a tendency to lie about those things in those years, and uh, and and therefore the laws were there to protect and defend them and the family, and that went by the wayside with no fault divorce, which was a Kinsey product. And of course now we're talking about Kinsey's research having been used in 2003 with the with the sodomy decision in with Texas, um, the Texas decision that that legalized all of these activities. Now that was all based. All that entire decision at the U.S. Supreme Court that legalized sodomy, which meant now you could teach it in the classroom, you know, and you could go down to the kindergarten and do that too. I mean, you could teach all the little kitties what to do. Um, all of that then was based upon Kinsey's fraudulent, fraudulent, and it's not flawed, it's fraud, research uh, imposed upon the great American population. So when you look around you and you see children being increasingly raped, they are. When you look around you and you see the Pentagon reporting 265 people caught, those are the ones that were caught or admitted to, downloading child pornography, many of them on the Pentagon computers. No, ladies and gentlemen, that was not the World War II generation. No, ladies and gentlemen, it was a lie about our our World War II people and our ancestors. No, ladies and gentlemen, they were not doing the things that Kinsey said they were doing, but they are increasingly doing them now. Wow. I guess you, you have pointed out consistently the huge impact that this criminal and deviant research had and continues to have uh, on people in this area of the world and, and really beyond just the uh, United States. Um, I wanted to start picking out some specific things and just showing how how big of an impact this work had. Um, I guess starting with um, the whole field, the academic field of uh, sexology <laughs> that mm -hmm. kind of grew out mm -hmm. of this work. 
Yeah, well, there was no, you know, there was no sexology uh, being taught. There was no human sexuality being taught. That was a great, quote, contribution Kinsey made. He's going to let us be open about all this, right? Well, in 1948 when he hit, the laws were based on the common law, and the common law was based upon biblical law in the United States of America. And you cannot change laws unless you have a precedent. So the precedent to change our laws had to be uh, science, okay, so science comes in, Kinsey claims he's done all this this methodologically pure research that uh, America is doing all these bizarre things, but, but, ladies and gentlemen, he argues, he says, he claims, he proves, quote, unquote, there's no real bad consequence to all this promiscuity. We don't have a high rate of venereal disease. We don't have a high rate of out-of-wedlock pregnancies, which we called illegitimate at the time. We don't have a high rate of rape. Oh, gracious, no. We, you know, we weren't, we didn't even have contraception widely distributed, and abortion is still illegal during Kinsey. And yet, he claimed there was no real rape. None of this was really doing any harm. So if sex is not doing any harm promiscuity, and if your parents are a bunch of, quote, hypocrites, which is what all these kids learn when they went to college, then you start the sexual revolution. You fall into that because you can't trust anything your parents say. They've been talking about their virgin experiences, and you've learned in college that their par- your parents are liars. So all that gets, that gets kicked out onto the mainstream. You get sex, drugs, rock and roll. You get kids who are calling their parents hypocrites. These are the parents who saved the world during World War II, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and the whole thing gets turned on its head. Now we've got the little kitties hooking up. We've got the children sending dirty pictures of themselves. Don't even know it's dirty, you know? Uh, to all sorts of people um, kidnapping. We have 58,200 children, even according to the Department of Justice, which does not like to admit these things, 58,200 children kidnapped by not family members, not by family members. There were a couple million, you know, that have been into, in and out of those kinds of problems. But anyway, 58,200 in 1998 kidnapped uh, from their homes, from the streets, from the playgrounds. Uh, most of them coming back home uh, sexually molested, another 200 uh, sexually raped and so forth and killed. And this is not the America of the greatest generation, Mr. and Mrs. America out there. And anybody who tries to tell you differently is way too young and has been watching too much TV and watching too many films and has to start learning a little bit about American history. Hmm. So you get this new academic field of sexology, and, yes. and you talk about the the social engineering that built mm-hmm. on Kinsey's work. Uh, I wanted to pick out, I guess, a few few different topics and, and see, and you can kind of share how the impact that it had. Um, the sexualization of children, uh, one of the quotes that really stood out from the research, it said that we found many beautiful and mutually satisfying relationships between fathers and daughters. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's, yeah, that's, that would be um, Paul Gebhardt, as I recall, or Wardell Palmer, I forget which one, uh, his, his co-authors, right, who were also his lovers, by the way, mm. part-time lovers. He never stopped, you know, had to hang around with any one guy too long. They, they, he liked young, pretty guys, by the way. Those are the only ones he used. Um, uh, beautiful white Anglo-Saxon uh, fellows, and, and they had to be part of his harem. These, the, you know, this was his harem <laughs> that he took around with him when he was exploiting during World War II, taking the the gasoline and the tires that should have been uh, should have been had should should have been uh, available to our soldiers. He took the rations and did that. Yeah. So that was Paul Gephardt or Wardell Pomeroy. They both were saying those sorts of things that uh, you could have sex with uh, incestuous relationships. Um, this was a Penthouse magazine uh, was reporting the same, the, these quotes by, by Kinsey's, uh, by Kinsey's uh, co-authors. Uh, Kinsey himself said that incest was harmless and that the children were, were trying to negotiate to have incest. We have judges and we have law review articles quoting Kinsey and claiming that children age four years old are seductive and, and trying to have sex with adults. We have the group for the advancement of psychiatry 
advocating age seven for age of consent uh, in in our laws. I mean, you know, I'm surprised that we aren't worse off than we are right now. Wow. Well, it's pretty bad. I, I... I would hate to think it could be worse because it's, it's pretty Oh, it bad. can be. Oh, it can be. And it will be unless and until we can try and get past the censors because all my work has been censored constantly by the powers that be, by the universities who don't want to, do not want to tell the truth about it. Fortunately, my books are now being used as textbooks by Liberty um, University to train their lawyers. But uh, I have found enormous censorship of my work all these years since I worked for the Department of Justice um, and did the research on images of children, crime, and violence in Playboy, Penthouse, and Hustler. Uh, this material is, is being censored everywhere. Academicians don't want to admit that, they, that they've been fools or that they're part of the problem, um, and so they fight it tooth and nail. The Congress has been stymied. FBI, DOJ, when I worked there, we had a major task force we were supposed to be launching, and we got stopped even under Reagan at the top somewhere along the line. They crushed our task force. So when you can stop the task force that has already been identified and, and FBI is involved, and, you know, part of the task force and Department of Justice, Juvenile Justice, and when you can and, – and law enforcement, when somebody high, high – placed high enough above can kill that task force. In 1983, when we were going to look at sexology as part of our mission statement and we were supposed to look at pornography and sexology as causing kidnapping of children, rape of children, that sort of thing in 1983, right? When you can kill that research, you know you're dealing with powerful foes up there. With lots of money, I suspect. Um... Oh, billions. They went after me, you know, when... <laughs> <laughs> they were spending what was it? I, a grain company reported roughly a million dollars a year for a couple of years to smear me. So I and I was just a little little peanut in this whole thing. Wow, wow. The you 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 already mentioned um, the so-called homosexual revolution. Uh, homosexuality was in the diagnostic and statistical manual as a form of pathology not that long ago. Uh, the mm-hmm. Well done. Yeah. Did, did Kinsey's research have an impact on getting It was the name? only research. It was the only research cited to kill uh to kill homosexuality as a mental disorder. Uh way back Dr. Socarides was there and he wrote about it at uh, at the you know at the discussions and so forth. So Kinsey's was the only research cited between that and the violence that the homosexual movement at the time inflicted on these the 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 doctors who are used to being kings, you know, they're not used to people spitting at them, sort of thing, and storming around like little stormtroopers. Uh, so, you know, the, the, they they crumbled pretty fast. But yes, the only research that existed at that time that was used to change that decision was the research by Dr. Alfred Kinsey. So he's the foundation of the homosexual movement, and they say so. I mean, there's not any issue there. They absolutely claim him as the father of their revolution. Do you uh, do you think it was correct that homosexuality was listed as a form of deep sexual deviance? Oh, no, yeah, of course it is. Of course homosexuality. It's heterophobia, by the way. It's fear of the opposite sex. In, in fact, that's what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, I mean, when you look at the data and you interview the people I've interviewed over these many, many, many years, they're looking at a, a behavior that usually stems out of either early sexual abuse of these folks, you know, uh, somebody, and or a highly a high degree of neglect by uh, by the father and the over, you know, the o- overtaking of that process by mom, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, there's not ha- these are not happy, healthy environments that folks are growing up in. And when you add pornography as, as is existing today, I tell you a story. I was lecturing to one recovering homosexual group, and, and the lights are going on for these guys everywhere because, you know, pornography is a huge component of homosexuality that is, quote, heterosexual pornography, if you call it that, but it isn't. Uh, you know, you introduce the young boy to uh, to sex with him with a man by showing him Playboy in, in the early years. Now, then it was penthouse and that sort of thing. So you try to introduce him slowly, and then you manipulate him and you take him over, and then you tell the boy he's gay. You know, <laughs> wow. 
I mean, we're, we've got thousands of, of young men dying of AIDS who have been infected by adult males, right? Do you see thousands of adult males being arrested for, for killing these, ba- these young boys because they've had AIDS? No. But that is, of course, exactly what's been happening because what they do then is they turn around and tell the boy, well, you know, you were gay and therefore you you were uh, up for it, you know, kind of thing. And it used to be you'd say that about girls. She says, no, 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 but she really means yes, yes, yes. So now they, they're applying that to young boys and we have young boys con- contracting AIDS from adult men and then the boys will act out on girls because they want to prove to themselves their masculinity. We have infections then in these girls and in women. Um, so it's it's a bad situation. Nobody who is quote unquote gay is happy. I mean, this is not a happy place to be. It's a death sentence for the most part. One in five boys uh who have sex according to to the Washington Post Whitman Walker Clinic advertisement about AIDS, one in five of, of these guys is going to die. You know, die as a result. Now, very few homosexual guys have only five partners. So you're talking about Russian roulette. There's nothing healthy about that. There's nothing normal about that. People are not designed to be so unhappy and to be so distressed and to be so penalized um, in terms of health and, and, and their life existence. Again, uh, our guest for today's broadcast, uh, Dr. Judith Reisman. And actually, I checked. We were both correct. Uh, you oh, can good use, for us. <laughs> <laughs> you can use .org or .com. Either one will work out. So the web address, uh, Dr. Judith Reisman, just her name, .org or .com will get you. And that's D R, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> so good for us. We exactly. are We are on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow. So, so we already touched on a few of them. Um, Abortion, Roe uh, Ro versus Wade. Does does Kinsey's research pop up there as well? Oh, absolutely. And one of the major abortion uh, books on the, on this by by highly recognizable leftists, uh, cre- you know, credits Kinsey with with being the foundation of the abortion revolution. Uh, we could go into all sorts of reasons as to why, but certainly in Roe v. Wade. Uh, uh, Calderon, Mary Calderon, who is the head of Planned Parenthood, is citing Kinsey's alleged research to prove that abortion is harmless, that uh, it aids in relationships, and, uh, and, and that becomes part of the dogma that drives the abortion revolution. So, so there's a lot of blood, uh, spilled that, uh, that can be put right smack dab at, at the feet of Indiana University, which has been covering it up all these years, and their key king of this whole cult, and it's a primitive sex cult. There's nothing new about all this, by the way. It goes right back to pansexuality. It's a primitive sex cult that promotes every form of deviance, uh, orgies, uh, you know, uh, the, the head of the whole foundation, the Harvard, the whole field institute advanced study of Human Sexuality in San Francisco uh, has a book called Meditations, the Gift of Sexuality, where their faculty, their staff, their students are all engaged in nude orgies in this book. It's a picture book, you know, sort of a coffee table thing, you know, invite people over. And um, that is the foundation of the whole field. Uh, the people who have been trained there go into the courtrooms, testify in our so-called conservative law firms, do not challenge these people appropriately if they challenge them at all. And so, yes, we lose major cases, and we lose major cases because the legal folks are either ignorant or simply don't want to address this issue in the courtroom. So, no excuse. Wow. Wow. Um. I think I'm being fairly blunt about all this. Would you say? I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And and I mean, you you back up strongly uh, everything that you say in your writing and your articles. Uh, you have a lot of evidence to support what you're oh, saying. Oh, let me tell you, if I wasn't able to support every single word that I have uttered, that I have written, 
I would have been sued off the face of the earth by these guys. The Kinsey Institute threatened to sue me a long time ago. I said, go for it, and they backed down so fast. Um, so, no, no, no. And Playboy threatened to sue me. We won them, of course, in the Netherlands. I men- mentioned that. So, no, there's nothing. There's nothing that these people want less than to have to go into a courtroom because once you go into a courtroom, you have the right of discovery, and that is where you find all the stuff. Look, I'm just talking about what's right on the surface, much less to get into these places and really find out what they've been hiding Mm. from the American public. Wow. And Mm -hmm. the the research that uh, Mr. Alfred Kinsey began, um, it's now uh, at Indiana University. What the current name for uh, the folks? Oh here? yeah, Indiana University. It's still it's the Kinsey Institute. Kinsey it's Institute. named after wow. this psychopath, right? The Kinsey Institute, and they're funded by you and me, ladies and gentlemen. They they get state tax funding. They get federal tax funding. They get uh, private enterprise tax funding. The uh, the uh, Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, different quote unquote foundations are funding them to try and keep people like me quiet because if people like you find out what's been going on all along, you're talking about a new revolution. You're talking about taking back America, ladies and gentlemen. So if you knew what was done to you and your family by these people, oh, step back. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. And and these folks are still unwilling to divulge the research so people can really see what uh, information they have and pedophiles and what have you they worked with. Is that accurate? Oh, yes. They threatened to, to destroy the records. Uh, you know, if if they are ever challenged, they give all sorts of fancy reasons, privacy and all that sort of stuff. But we happen to know that when you go around raping children, you know, you don't have the right to privacy, do you? I hope not. Yeah, well, not yet. So, so no, I mean, all of that material ought to be in the hands of the public. It's public domain. These were publicly funded people. They owe and they are obligated legally to turn over all their records. Uh, we just need a couple of judges to slap an injunction on those guys and get the police to guard the doors before they destroy everything. Hmm. Be- I guess when I was a little, little, uh, just a little more ignorant, less informed than I am now, uh, if someone had come to me and said, you know, we're gonna we're gonna lower the age of consent uh, mm-hmm. for sexual intercourse, uh, I would have probably said, it's, you know, that's no big deal. Uh, that might even be a good thing. I don't I don't really see a problem with that. Um, well, what is your your stance on the age being lowered as a result of Kinsey's work? Well, it's tragic. I mean, of course it's tragic. You're opening children to every form of sexual violence and sexual exploitation. Uh, We have to remember one of the things that's critical and to, to understand, and that's the reason you can't have sex education in the classroom, and that is that the human brain it does not begin to achieve frontal cortical maturity until roughly age 21. Uh, you're talking about bringing sex into people's lives when they're absolutely unable in any way, shape, or form to handle this kind of stimuli. Look, most adults can't handle it. That's why you want to have sex in marriage, you know, (laughs) where there's there's some chance that you'll be able to work through problems that come about and that sort of thing. Uh, No, you know, the, the old common law said marital coitus. That's what it is. The marital act is what it was called. We weren't talking sexual intercourse. We were talking the marital act, thank you very much. And by golly, that is exactly the kind of concept that allowed this country to become the most affluent, the most productive, the most outstanding nation in the world. You've got to guard the sexual conduct of people. People have to be able to engage in sex in extremely safe and secure environments. And the only safe and secure environment for that is when you're married to somebody that's going to say, yeah, I I love, honor, and cherish until death I do part. And they may not stick by it, and there may be problems, but that's a heck of a lot different than the hooking up today that's driving people absolutely insane, and I use that term uh, advisedly. So that's my reply to that. (laughs) Which, Which term? Uh, oh, insane. It's, you know, yeah, you're talking about an attack 
on the mental stability of our youth. Absolutely an attack on that because you cannot have kids engage in this kind of activity and expect them to be able to function appropriately in, in their lives and in society, it's not going to happen. You'll have a few people who come through. Yeah, sure you will, you know. But for the most part, you're going to start talking to the whole issue of people succumbing to alcoholism, succumbing to drug consumption, succumbing to um, uh, pills. Our young guys are now taking Viagra because they can't function without it. Give me a break. This is not a healthy, happy bunch of people. Mm. Wow. Wow. I, I, I can point to one group of folks that I think they're very happy. Uh, I think mm-hmm. these folks benefited a lot from uh, Kinsey's research and the so-called sexual revolution, uh, the pornography uh, industry. Oh, yeah. Uh, pornography industry absolutely was the major out, outgrowth of Kinsey. I mean, he made his own pornography. He forced his his staff to participate in all pornographic stuff. He was doing up in his attic and in his soundproof rooms at Indiana University. And, by the way, there's every reason to believe that that was continued after he died. But, yeah, but I don't know that I would call the, the, the individuals happy. I would say maybe they think that they're happy because they're racking in the money. But you're, again, talking about an industry that relies on drugs, alcohol, and every other, and that is rife with sexual disease. Now, I urge people to go to uh, Shelley Lubin's website. She's um, a recovered uh, pornography star and prostitute, and she's got a website called Pink Cross because she has uh, turned her life around and become uh, and, and converted and is and is helping uh, women and, and men in in this lifestyle and or death style really, and and she'll give you some real heads up on the trauma and the misery and the heartbreak and the physical. Uh, physical abuse and physical pain that's part of that whole field. There's nothing pretty about it, ladies and gentlemen. Nada. At the website, I just found it, thepinkcross.org. Yeah. That's the mm-hmm. website, uh, Shelley. That's Luke. it. Thepinkcross.org. Yes. <clears throat> I urge people to look at that website and look at what Shelley did. Oh, she did such a beautiful kind jobs, gentle and, and, and thoughtful with the with the, her her section on the dead porn stars where she just kind of lets you go through all of these young women and young men whose lives have been completely destroyed. They were porn stars and they're dead now based on a suicide, drug overdose, everything in the world that you can possibly imagine. This is not a happy place to be. And the advertising that's out there that would advertise this to children, to young girls, young boys to go into, oh, look, you know, do this, you'll be lovely. You'll, look at this Paris Hilton, what a good example. I mean, and this Lindsay Lohan and all these pathetic, pathetic people whose lives are completely ruined. And no news there. You can't do sexual promiscuity in a in a world and still stay healthy. Everybody knows that. Hmm. What? Okay. So let me let me play devil's advocate for the folks who Go ahead. say, you know, uh, this just sounds kind of prudish and. Uh, oh, we're just, indeed. We're oh. just we're just talking about having sex. It's natural. It's healthy to have sex. It doesn't have that big an impact. Uh, pornography is just, uh, it's, it's entertainment, it's fun, uh, and it doesn't have any sort of lasting, long-term uh, repercussions on my mental health. What would your response be? Well, then you better start reading more and thinking more because your brain's already addled. <laughs> wow. Because the research, are, the research is so clear, and if you needed research, I mean, anybody who's still kind of on their feet, and starts to think about it, knows that that's ridiculous. Uh, first of all, we're talking about reduce, uh, seducing and, and collecting younger and younger people into this activity. We're talking about age of consent dropping. We're talking about 
children now being used, you know, it used to be that if you were downloading pornography at the Pentagon, you'd figure they were downloading adult pornography. Forget it. That's gone by the wayside. Once you become addicted to the one, you're going to be addicted to the other, and you're on your way down to child pornography. Now, maybe some people don't, and they're still stuck in the in the adult stuff, but that means that they can't, they're impotent by definition. Potency means you have the power of your own ability. You do not need, like my great-grandpa sure didn't need to have pictures of girls when he, was, when he had 16 children, right? Uh, potency means you have the power of your own masculinity. What people don't understand is all pornography has been aimed at the, at the creation of impotence, at emasculating men. Women were just women, the girls and that sort of thing. They are just the 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 tools you know the the booty the the you know that comes out of this but the attack has been on the men um potency means that you have your own power impotency means you're without that power you can't make love to the person that you're supposed to love without imagining an image of somebody else or even imagining her in an image or a scene that by definition ladies and gentlemen means that the individual who has to do that is impotent. And that is exactly what all pornography of every kind, so-called soft and hard, will do to the user after any period of time. So you may think that you are potent because when you picture that image and you're with somebody, you're using that person simply as a as some kind of a uh, a receptacle. There isn't a relationship. That means... You've been taken over, bud, and you are controlled by the guys who produce the pornography and not by your own potency. Hmm. You you said that <clears throat> the adult pornography, uh, it's it's just going to lead you or certainly lead a lot of people to the child pornography. Why do you think that is? It's an addictive process. It's a neuro, neurophysiological process. Your brain works in a certain way. It's like, hey, look... All pornography are drugs. It, it, tr- it triggers a dopamine spritz. It triggers in, in males and in females too testosterone production. It triggers a whole broad spectrum of a, a cocktail of, uh, of drugs, internal drugs that you make yourself. We call those natural drugs or endogenous drugs. So it's like any other drug. Uh, if you start taking a drug after a certain point in time, it is not adequate to cause the arousal state that you're looking for, to blank you out, to get you high. So in order to get you high, you hike up the ante and you take something that's a little more. All pornography triggers shame, massive shame. If you lose your ability to feel enough shame because you've become adjusted to one level of pornography, you'll reach out for the rest. It'll be sadomasochistic. It'll be um, a bestial. It'll be uh, um, a, you know various forms of sodomy. I mean that sort of thing, and then eventually, and not so not so slowly anymore with the current state of affairs, you'll slip down to a great extent. A lot of you are going to slip down into child pornography. Everybody says, "Oh, I would never do that." Well, I'm sorry, we're arresting them right and left because we still have a few people that'll do the arresting. But when we have enough police and we have enough judges and we have enough legislators who themselves are addicted. To pornography and addicted to child pornography, what do you think is going to happen to our laws? Wow. What, uh, well, I guess, why? Why do you think uh, this billion dollar pornography industry is aimed at uh, making males impotent? Well, uh, I, you can start off with just a personal deal. I mean, I think that all, that the guys who themselves are impotent, that guys who have lost their ability to be masculine, their ability to to have a relationship with a, a human woman, to produce a family and have all of the beauty and all the joys thereof, as well as the trauma and the struggles, you know, that, that those guys are just incredibly jealous. As far as I'm concerned, we know full well that somebody like Hefner, who can't function without his pills and stuff, and who can't even function then, uh, and and Guccione and and and, um, and and Flint and all the rest of them, we know that they're jealous as the devil of any male who can function and who can be a real man because they aren't real men. And then of course there's all the there's all the rest of it. I mean, in terms of the conspiracy theory sort of thing that 
You know, the more you can destroy the men of any country, the more you take over that country and you control that country. If the males are not there to defend our laws, if the males are not there to fight these battles, then you've taken over the country, and that's exactly what we see taking place today. Hmm. So take your pick or come up with something better. <laughs> wow. Wow. This is this is really detailed. I would encourage folks, uh, go to her website because you can, you can look at this for yourself and see some of the charts and read some of the articles, books, and, and what have you. But you talk about the sex industrial complex and mm-hmm. how the porn, porn industry, uh, the pharmaceutical companies, and the uh, sexology uh, academia, they are all related uh, mm-hmm. and have a nice synergy. Can you kind of break that down for our audience? Oh, absolutely. Forget the, the, uh, the um, uh, what did we call it, uh, Eisenhower, which, which, yeah, the, the war complex, I've forgotten what he called it. Yeah, you're really now talking about the biggest, the most important mind control structure that's ever been created, I think, and that's the sex industrial complex. For years, uh, sexologists who are trained dysfunctionally and who watch pornography for hours, days, weeks, months in order to get their degrees, by the way, um, we're talking about sexologists having gone into the courtrooms to stand in place and to claim that all pornography is really harmless and actually is good. It helps us, you know, it helps us grow. Uh, in fact, that's what Sikas and Planned Parenthood claim when they go into the court, into the classrooms today. But anyway, so for years we had this link up between big sexology and big pornography. The one supported the other. The pornographer paid the sexologist to do their bidding, right? Uh, and just like they paid, they, the tobacco used to pay the, the, the uh, tobacco, tobacco used to pay the scientists to claim that tobacco was harmless. So we have sexologists being paid by pornographers to claim that that's harmless. Well, as you created more and more dysfunction, uh, the sexologists were happy to say, and I quote in there, our dance cards are no longer empty. We now are wanted by big pharma. Well, of course they're wanted by Big Pharma because when you emasculate your population, they need the little blue pills. So Big Pharma steps in to to give the little blue pills to everybody, start giving everybody Viagra, try to pay, they're paying a fortune to try and find uh, a, a, a little blue pill like Viagra for women. They've got a whole bunch of those they tried. They didn't really work. But the other big piece of that thing is that as you're able to uh, sexualize a society and make the children engage in sex early, you're able then to go around and say, well, we have to now vaccinate all our little babies for, H- for Hep B, which is a venereal disease, and now we have to give HPV to our little children. Why do we have to do that? We have to do that because we're assuming that they'll all be sexually active from birth. That's billions of dollars that goes into the pockets of Big Pharma, in addition to that, all of the subsequent diseases and uh, all of the subsequent problems that come as a result of all these early vaccine uh, uh, insults to the brain body of these children are going to increase your intake there, your, your expenses. You're going to be racking in the money, the likes of which you never knew. So the more promiscuity increases, the more big pharma makes a fortune in big sexology and big, se- and, and, uh, and big pornography. It's, it's a... It's a win-win proposition for the bad guys, as they'd say. Wow. What, I guess, just the time that you've been doing this research, have you observed uh, just a greater acceptance of pornography? And if so, can you, like, list some examples of where you're seeing this just being more more commonplace? No, it's not really that big of a deal to anyone anymore? Well, everybody out there knows it. Uh, you know, you turn on the television and um, – even even leftists are shocked <laughs> at the kind of thing you see on TV, much less in the films, the language that we're hearing, the four-letter words that uh, nobody even used before, much less find on television. And, of course, there's always Victoria's Secrets and Victoria's, you know, in our local, in our local malls. And we have, of course, Sinclair's that sells pornography in all your local malls and sells this stuff even to children. And, of course, we have Sears and Robot catalog that's been uh, doing um, lesbian scenes and orgy scenes in order to sell their clothing. So, yeah, I'd say we've changed, and, and, and it really 
uh, those of us who are of age to remember that when you, you know, the, the worst thing Sears ever did was to have some underwear <laughs> images and they were as, as mild-mannered as anything, you know, and still people were a little bit shocked by them. So, but they were really selling the underwear. So, um, yeah, it's in our face everywhere, and the kids say it's in their face everywhere, and, of course, it's in the classroom in the form of sexually explicit graphic sex material that children are being taught and wanting to give little kitties demonstrations of how to use condoms, knowing full well nobody really uses those condoms. Um, and Sweden is producing little miniature condoms now, you know, because they say the little boys should be using condoms. I mean, it's insane, Mr. and Mrs. America. It is insane. Uh, would, would it be accurate to say this is uh, socially engineered sexual deviance? Oh, absolutely, it's socially engineered sexual deviance. I mean, um, you're talking about fortunes being made by highly questionable people, uh, by what we would call the bad guys, and, uh, and, and by emasculating your men, and by revolutionizing your women so that your women are part of the problem instead of part of the solution. You betcha. You're talking about socially engineering a, a, a society that cannot stand up for it itself eventually, that cannot even protect its own children. Mm. How bad is that? Doesn't get much worse, in my opinion. I mean, wow. Um, again, our guest guest for today's program, uh, Dr. Judith Reisman. Uh, please, the website, again, uh, com or .org. Um, <laughs> last name, again, is R E I S. M A N, or you can just click her name if you're listening at Blog Talk Radio. You can just click her name, and it'll take you right to her website. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And they should tell them to get the book. Oh yes, please. The book, brand new, just came out a couple weeks ago. Uh, mm -hmm. Sexual sabotage. Um, at any local bookstore, uh, at WorldNetDaily.com, and do get two books and bring one to your library and try to make sure that they put it up on the shelf because they're not going to buy it if they can avoid it. Wow. Um, yeah, and that's linked as well. You can click the image and you can get the uh, book right from, right from the website as well, Sexual Sabotage, How One Mad Scientist Unleashed a Plague of Corruption and Contagion on America. Um, I am all about uh, equipping my listeners, uh, giving them information, and sometimes just being able to give them uh, a turn that will help them better understand what's happening around them. Uh, can you explain what you mean when you use the term erototoxin? Ah, erototoxins, yes. It's a toxic form of eros. The whole idea that eros is benign, it's ludicrous, uh, when in fact the erotic is becomes dysfunctional for the brain, it is by definition toxic to the brain. And so that is absolutely what all pornography, and I include, by the way, Playboy magazine, please understand, because you don't get where we are today without having started somewhere else. And the somewhere else is always where it began as a benign appearing, you know, uh, experience. So neurochemically, and I talk about that to some extent in the book and in a prior book I did called Soft Porn Plays Hard Boy, Hardball, but neurochemically you were talking about material that is is disorienting the brain, that is uh, raising the thermostat, the pleasure thermostat of the brain to an extent that normal, healthy sexual activity no longer stimulates the individual adequately. That, ladies and gentlemen, makes it an erototoxin, toxic to the brain. Hmm. And I've, I've read some of the articles you emailed me as well, and you said uh, in the article, uh, Picture Poison, viewing pornography for a living can be deadly, that the more bizarre or strange uh, the, the sexual image, the more likely you are that you're going to remember it. It's going to really stick in your, in your mind. Is that accurate? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And all the brain science data now confirm that. They're taught, we, we now know what we've known all along, but it ha now has names and now has all sorts of hard 
uh, MRI, um, you know, brain study proof. And that is that we have a thing, something called the mirror neurons, which means that when you're looking at, at these kinds of sexual activities, just like when you're looking at violent activities, you're going to feel in the relevant component part of your body the kinds of stimuli that you're, that you're experiencing. That's why you don't look at pornography, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a good thing to do. Um, you know, that is supposed to be a private relationship that you have with a human being you can trust and love and honor. The minute you step into that kind of world, you're stepping into a world of shame and hostility, and that then hikes up the level of arousal. So, yeah, you know, you get a couple that's committing adultery. They're in the hotel, and uh, they're, they've been planning this for years, you know, and they're going to go to go for it, right? And And somebody else fire. Ladies and gentlemen, that couple is not going to stay there and goof around. They are grabbing a pair of pants and they're out that, you know, or a robe or something and out the door of that hotel fast as can be. Why? Because fear is much higher a stimuli than is sex. Pornography was never just about sex. No way. If it was, it would have no real value over, over your relationship with someone that you love. It is always about hiking your arousal due to the added sensation of fear, shame, hostility, and other kinds of stimuli. So don't ever think when you're responding to an erotic quote-unquote picture that you're just responding to that dear love between that nice man and that nice lady. Forget it. You're talking about knowing that you're engaged in some kind of voyeuristic observation, knowing that you're peering at people you should not be peering at because that's instinctive. And once you know that, you're feeling shame and you're feeling embarrassment, and that's if it's even just nice stuff. Hmm. You you said peering at people that you know you shouldn't be peering at. You Yeah, you, you're a voyeur. Okay. You you write about how that's another aspect, another damaging aspect of pornography is that it blurs the boundaries between what's private and what's public. Is that is that mm-hmm. accurate? Oh, very accurate. Very accurate. And our laws had been pre Kinsey had been uh based upon our knowledge that there's private behavior and there's public behavior and that and that much of what goes on in private absolutely does not belong in the public sphere. And that then changed once we began to say that the public did no longer have any control over sexuality because it's a private activity. The minute that happened, we began to lose control over our ability to uh, to monitor that sort of behavior. So that's why it slipped out into the public sphere. And it came through pornography into the public arena and from pornography into your local, uh, you know, um, um, your local malls and, and your TVs and everything else. So, you know, you're not meant to be voyeurs. You're not meant to be peering at other people's private activity. Any, You know, not neither their, their hygienic activity <laughs> nor their sexual activity. And the minute we begin to do those kinds of things, we're even, we're worse than animals because animals basically try to do things like that in the bush. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, this is a, a different, as I said, to the folks who are listening to this broadcast, please visit her website because uh, Dr. Reisman, she has just a ton of information. Um, one of the articles on your site, uh, The Naked Truth, an interview uh, with Doc, with you, um, on page four, um, you're talking about how a lot of the stimulus uh, and arousal that people get from uh, pornography uh, involuntary. I mean, you, your brain just starts firing mm-hmm. when you see these images. And mm-hmm. uh, you wrote that uh, it's not exclusively a heterosexual problem, uh, that this can also happen with homosexual stimulus. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, an individual is exposed to homosexual material and due to confusion, shame, and hostility, he or she feels aroused. Uh, The individual is really just in a state of crisis, but the brain interprets it as arousal, which causes him or her to self-identify as homosexual. That really jumped out at me because I heard someone who identifies as homosexual almost give that story verbatim. Yeah, yeah. If you talk to 
uh, to many homosexuals or people who think that they're homosexual, people who have been seduced into this activity, yeah, they will confirm those kinds of stimuli as taking place. And, and, and they try to rationalize. Now, when you're in a society that is pushing homosexuality as normal everywhere you turn, yeah, then, then what you're going to have is it becomes extremely difficult for that confused person. And usually they're teenagers. You know, usually it's a younger person who's confused as it is, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 I, I, I always find it amazing. Kids go to school and they're confused by mathematics and all. They don't suddenly decide that, uh, that, that somehow because they don't understand mathematics that that makes them a, a, you know, bizarre individual. But because they're confused about their sexuality, and people are always confused. They want somebody to love them. They want to be admired. They want to be treasured, right? And so... And, and they're frightened because there's such a desire for that pretty girl or that handsome young man to, to find them wonderful and then not to exploit them. There's so much, there's so many nuances, there's so much confusion there, so much crisis that takes place. And I have interviewed more, more people who have been caught in that crisis and then they've been told by older persons who seem to be knowing so much more that that they're homosexual and they're caught within that that framework and that has directed their lives and and they they can die you know as a result. By the way, you mentioned the business the the article I did on on viewing and I should reaffirm to the to the public to your public that that within the Department of Justice now they're having to give people who look at pornography pornography for any length of time, they're, they're having to give these people um, special uh, treatments and give them periods of time off because they are so disturbed by the, by the stimuli that they're seeing. So there's a great recognition now amongst the professionals in the field that what they have to look at is highly disorienting for their lives so that they're being treated. Now, that treatment is not available to the average person, the average teenager. And by the way, none of this is covered by the First Amendment. Images aren't covered by the First Amendment. Children can decipher images and decode them. Illiterate people can decipher images and decode them. That means they're not speech. They are something else entirely. They're an arousal stimulus, and they, in fact, subvert the speech process, process subvert the meaning and the mission of the speech process. There's nothing there that's consensual. It happens without their consent, and it happens to override all cognitive processes. There's no free speech in these images. Wow. Wow. What uh, What are your thoughts, then, on now you have a lot of uh, homosexual material being promoted uh, in the school system? Uh, Absolutely. Very young kids. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's why I want to take it into the courtroom and get this material, you know, presented to juries so they can start ruling on the uh, the, the lies that are being perpetrated to our children and making people pay for it. You need a couple of good, solid tobacco-like lawsuits where those who are, are promoting this material, that is Planned Parenthood, SICUS, and some of the teachers, some of the administrators, you get them into a situation, and some of Big Pharma, depending, uh, where they are able to prosecute properly with real knowledgeable lawyers. So far, we haven't found them too often. Uh, you get that into a courtroom, and you end your problem. People start paying through the nose millions of dollars. The next thing you know, they clean up their act. Did I hear you correctly that uh, Planned Parenthood is one of the organizations that's pushing the, the homosexual content in schools? Oh, sure. Of course you did. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, they've been pushing promiscuity and homosexuality for a long time. Of course they have. As a matter of fact, I got involved in this whole uh, sex, sex, uh, sexology field when um, – uh, Shaker Heights High School was distributing to its high school students a, 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 a pamphlet called that they produced, Planned Parenthood, called uh, You've Changed the Combination, in which they were telling children way back in 74 it was, to have sex with your friends. Now, see, here's a, here, here is a lawsuit just waiting to happen. Have sex with your friends. 
if she's uh, she's been stoned, ask. If she's too young, ask, but doesn't say don't have sex with her. And they go on and they give all these other bizarre things and that your parents have tried to force you into heterosexuality, you know, because they're afraid of you being homosexual, so they want you to look at, you know, to fool around with girls. Yeah. And then they end up by saying, if you want a virgin to marry, buy one. I'm quoting this. Uh, there are, are women who have freely chosen that business. Marriage is the price you'll pay. And you get the virgin very temporarily. I submit to you that, this, end quote, I submit to you that these are major lawsuits just waiting to happen for all the people who've gotten STDs, who've had abortions, who have lost their husbands, lost their wives, uh, who have um, had just their lives destroyed by Planned Parenthood and SICA, Sex Information Education Council of the United States, by all these lies that have been promoted in their classrooms. Oh, my just a great bunch of lawsuits waiting to happen. Anybody wants to do that and they know a good lawyer, I'm on your side. <laughs> wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had quite a few folks uh, dialed in. Uh, are you acceptable taking a few questions? A few. It's getting late, but uh, I'm ready. Okay. Okay. Um, person, I think... I don't know what the name is, Rondo. You have a hand up. Uh, I don't know if you're on your Skype or what have you, but if you have a question, sir, uh, your line is open. Hi. Good evening. Hello. Um, I'd like to know, would you agree or disagree that some of the most racist and sexist people on the planet are white homosexuals? Uh, let's see. Oh. Well, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, we could say that. Um, let's see, white homosexuals have a strong discriminatory policy against blacks in general, at least they used to. Uh, they may have backed off a little bit recently, but, um, yeah, I suppose. But uh, but it's certainly not confined to them. Is that or Hi? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, and I also want to know, since... Uh, the classical European societies, such as uh, Rome and Greece, were mm-hmm. dominated by men who had sex with little boys. Right, and yeah. What is the disconnect? Why would you say that this is not a Western pathology that's just morphed? into uh, a different form. Because I do agree with you that pornography is a gateway um, uh, media that is used to confuse people at a young age and also have them experiment. Right. But I'd like to know your opinion on how... The disconnect with Western society. How 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 are you disconnecting how Western society uses classical societies, and how those classical societies were essentially pedophilic? Right. Well, it isn't that's, just Western. I mean, yeah, that that's international. Uh, certainly, the the um, the Arab communities or Ar- Arabic societies, Muslim societies, uh, have had a huge. Uh, tradition of sexual abuse of boys, you know, so that's been pretty standard, as have a lot of the other um, uh, animalistic or uh, animus, I forgot what you call them, uh, you know, cultures, in which um, wherever you have a society in which women are denigrated, you will have a high rate of boy abuse, okay? Now, the United States of America and so, you know, in England and and uh, and some of the other uh, Westernized countries, have slowly evolved to the point where they they kind of began to understand the necessity for raising women to standards. Uh, Jesus Christ, I think, was the first one, you know, that was you that that actually advocated, you know, that women were human too, just like guys were. And um, so, uh, you, you had a a, a move to elevate women. And in elevating women, you elevated society. You created a society that would be able to have streets and hospitals, you know, and and running water, clean water, electricity, which most of the world doesn't have. Uh, Most of the world that doesn't have this stuff 
uh, also confine women to very low levels within their within their society. So, so yeah, and we had to battle in this country. We had the white slave trade here. Uh, you know, it hasn't always. I mean, we we haven't always had this recognition of the uh, Judeo-Christian belief system that would have put into place consistently the value of women as uh, as ennobled. And I'm not saying, and by the way, during the period when women did not have the vote, uh, they certainly still had status to a great extent in this country on, on different levels. But And most people don't realize that the suffrage that, uh, you know, getting the vote Women fought to get the vote because of the high rate of, of alcohol consumption at that time during the ninth, late ninth, 1800s, early 1920s. So, um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's always a battle, and the battle is only won by the society that values the relationship between a woman and man, uh, that places sexual conduct only within a marital structure where women are not... Uh, cut and, and um, circumcised as they are in other cultures and where that marriage is expected to produce children and the parents are expected to rear those children. And that becomes a society that gives you a civilization that's worthy of the name and that's a pleasant and safe place within which to live. Does that answer what your question was? Um, absolutely. I'm going to actually purchase your book because I find it it's a I, I'm of the belief that pornography, we, we're sold as men that it's just used to, it's a substitute. But um, I, I I know from experience that they, they, they try to put out, you, you, they try to put out different information um, so as to seduce you into other styles of lifestyles. Mm-hmm. So, they want um, to emasculate you. Right. They want to emasculate you. That's what the pornography is there to do. Once you are emasculated, you are a victim of their material. You then can't function without their stuff. And that goes on and on and on. Otherwise, if you married some woman who you loved and she loved you, you could begin to actually live a very full life without ever having recourse to any of these expensive indulgences. And that, by the way, the pornography is linked to the alcohol consumption and the drug consumption. Oh, I should mention, there's a reason that Playboy magazine always promoted um, illicit drugs and always sold illicit alcohol, and that is because it's interrelated with the despair that people feel when they become addicted to the material. Is that sort of... So do buy the book. <laughs> it's linked. You can get the uh, go to the website. You can click the uh, icon for the book on the program, and uh, you said WND. Yeah, right? World Net Daily, right? World Net Daily. You can pick it up there as well. Uh, person who called from a blocked number. Did you have a call uh, question for Dr. Reisman? Was that me? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. I'm I'm enjoying the show a lot. My mouth was to the floor for a lot of it. I, I know about. Uh, much of it, uh, particularly in Washington, from the K. Griggs interview. Have you ever uh, had a chance to view that? No. Uh. Uh-uh. Okay. It's K. 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 A. Y. E. Griggs with two G's on the end, and she was married to a man in the military, who died and left mm-hmm. behind a diary oh, in yes. which. He, okay. Yeah. We got all the homosexual activity in Washington, the pedophilia. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Yeah, you're, mm-hmm. you're, what you were talking about made me think of that. But I just wonder, with it being so pervasive, what on earth can we do to protect children from it? Because they've even had Katy Perry, you know, whose lesbian song, I Kissed a Girl and I Like It, was number one. They mm-hmm. had her do a video with Elmo for Sesame Street. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. But, you know, I mean... <laughs> Americans have defeated a lot of enemies in the past. All right, this time it's a real serious domestic enemy. And that's why I press, I keep trying to get people to wake up, smell the coffee, and get into the courtroom. Because there is nothing that is as disastrous 
as a great lawsuit that cost people millions and millions and millions of dollars for waking the public up and allowing them to understand how they've been how they've been lied to. Look, when I started this material, I used to talk about pedophilia, and people thought that meant somebody who liked to ride a bicycle, pedophilia, right? Right? So there's been a major change in our character. I'm not denying that. We have no choice but to battle it, and let's do it. Uh, Mr. Nero, did you have a question? Mr. Nero, your line should be open, sir. Hello? Um, Mr. Nero, did you have a question or are you just listening? Mr. Nero. I think Mr. Nero is just listening. No problem. <laughs> um, non Mighty Wick, did you have a question? Non Mighty Wick, your line is open. Do you have a question? Just listening. Mm, non Mighty Wick. Not questioning either. All right. What am I scaring everybody? Come on, you know. Oh. I'm easy. I, you know, I'm not a problem. I'm, you know. oh, okay. They say I'm cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, person who called in last four digits two nine three four two nine three four. Did you have a question? Hello. Ah, there's a live one. Um, yes, I have a question. Um, what about um, the lesbian, the lesbianism that's rising in this country as well? Mm-hmm, absolutely. Well, you know, when promiscuity increases massively, you know, everything increases. Now, lesbians generally in the past have really been, for the most part, incest victims. Uh, homosexual males very commonly were not incest as much victims as they were victims of uh, males who came after them, you know, from the age of, say, about 13 on sort of thing, or younger. But 64% actually of our forcible sodomy victims are boys under age 12 now. But lesbians, yeah, um, what has happened now is that lesbian behavior has changed radically from the way it was earlier on in the, in you know, say in the ni- in, uh, 1950s or 60s or 70s, really. Uh, and the lesbians have adopted more and more of the sadomasochistic kind of stuff that, that our homosexual males are moving into as well. They're heavily into what they call leather, which is sadomasochism, which they torture one another. Un- unbelievable why you do this sort of thing. You know, why, why do you want to suffer? Well, there's the point. They do want to suffer because of the pain that's internal. And so they inflict massive physical pain on one another, and the lesbians are moving into that as well. And one of the big issues here then has to do, of course, with early uh, seduction in the school system. You have to remember that girls will generally do whatever they think will attract the interest of guys. And most of your pornography includes the pseudo-lesbian scenes, uh, you know, with girls doing things to each other. I won't even tell you what they call that because it makes me angry. So we'll just skip what they're calling it. And we'll say that it includes most of that. Now, young girls in the high schools and in the junior high schools and even younger often are imitating that kind of behavior. And once you imitate it long enough, it can become part of your life behavior as well. So heavy-duty classroom seduction of girls and boys into homosexual activity, girls particularly susceptible to wanting to do those things to, to attract the boys. The boys then cheer them on, you know. And the same thing with the t-shirt sort of things and all that kind of stuff and these girls all think they're being free they think that they're being um, liberated and of course they're not they're being enslaved does that answer your question um yes and um, i also have another question too um do you sure. think this is part of the um population control have you ever heard of population oh. control Yes, yeah, that, that's a very good point. Yeah, well, the Rockefeller Foundation, as you know, long has been involved, as has Planned Parenthood, in population control uh, activities, shall we say. And so, yeah, I mean, I've heard that. It makes sense to me. Uh, homosexuality means no kiss. And uh, so the whole idea and, and this promiscuity and promotion of material goods, limiting your, your, child, your child population, so, and, of course, that goes along with abortion. So, yes, uh, I don't think there's any question that some of that's involved here. Where it starts and, you know, and where it lets off, uh, I, I can't say, but I certainly can say 
that population control is what happens when you have a large homosexual population. Right. Does okay, that answer that? Um, yes, thank sure. you. Um, that's, that's all the questions thank I have. You. Get the book. <laughs> if I'm talking to you on the phone, you go get the book. Sexual Sabotage just came out. Sexual Sabotage. Lots of this information that we've discussed and uh, a lot more detail uh, is in the book. Sexual Sabotage just came out. Um, person who called in, 7894. 7894, did you have a question? <clears throat> Okay, 7894 doesn't want to talk to me either. Uh, You're hurting my feelings, 7894. <laughs> you know? Uh, and I do urge people to get the book, but also to give copies to their, to, to their you know, loved ones, uh, to people they feel. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an objective book. It's not a book that's hysterical in any way. And so if you're concerned about turning it over, you know, to, to people, it's well footnoted. It's a good, good scholarly piece of work, but unfortunately it's really interesting because it's all about sex and drugs and rock and roll kind of thing, you know, so there you are. It's people's uh, favorite subject matter there, such subject matters. <laughs> well, it attracts high response mechanisms, yes. Mm, uh, 818, did you have a follow-up question, 818? Yes, I do. Um, I noticed another news story where it was in Florida and they were two homosexual males fighting for the right to adopt children I think they had been foster parents to. Do you think that adoption of children by homosexual uh, adults will lead to the children being molested or becoming homosexual themselves or that there's any kind of pedophilia connection there? Well, I've testified in courts on that, and I've said uh, exactly that, that you do not award children like, you know, like you do dogs. I mean, they are not, you know, experimental products, right? And you do not award them to homosexuals. You simply don't do that. And, and, and the American public knew that for years and years and years. But, of course, we've been manipulated by the judicial system. Uh, no, this is not something you do. You try to help the homosexuals themselves come to grips with why they have chosen to engage in this kind of activity. You try to help. With, that's what used to be the case. Uh, and, and you certainly don't give them experimental uh, children to uh to to uh to see how that's going to work out. Uh you try to find the most well-balanced couples, of course, uh that you possibly can who will love and honor these children and bring them up in a normal household with a mother and a father. That is one is a boy and I mean one is a woman and one is a man. The old-fashioned way, which as far as we can see, has been the only way to really rear reasonably content and happy kids. And how would you counter the the popular, you know, uh, I guess contradictions that are out now where people are saying, oh, you know, there's people that are homosexual and they're perfectly functional and normal and come on, you know, they're born that way. They function in society. Well, that's why I write the book and you read the book and you become knowledgeable so that when you're engaged in these debates, you know, you can quote the data as it stands and bring some common sense to the arguments. Okay. Uh, but that's the reason that it's important for us to read and be knowledgeable. Uh, when I've been in the courtroom, I've won. Um, and I have won because, you know, I'm knowledgeable in the area. And I've done the research and read the homosexual material itself. A, a, a very important book, Men Who Beat the Men Who Love Them. Uh, by two homosexual males, all sorts of material out there. I read a, a great deal of homosexual literature because it's within the literature of the population itself that your answers will be found. Thank you. Sure. Yep. Get the book. <laughs> I will definitely go out and see if they have it at my bookstore. Good. And, oh, tell your libraries to buy it. Some of the libraries actually might even do that. Okay. Was that book uh, Men Who Beat the Men That Love Them? Yeah, Men Who Beat the Men Who Love Them. Okay. Yeah, and it's all, it's, it's, it is by two homosexual males. One is a psychologist, and the other one is a social worker. 
and the book deals with um, domestic violence within the homosexual movement. And when I say domestic violence, I don't mean monogamous homosexual marriages because that's an oxymoron. You basically do not have such things. It, it, it certainly would probably occur in some rare situations, but this whole marriage business is, is uh, based on a fraudulent uh, belief system, and that is that homosexuals actually seek uh, monogamous marriages, which is just not the case. Hmm. Wow. Wow. I, uh, I feel like we have learned a ton. I guess, uh, I guess if I can give one more in, um, from, uh, this is, I'm going back to one of the articles that you, that you emailed me, um, The Naked Truth. Um, on, on page four, uh, you wrote that, uh, people know full well that you will never shut down uh, sex trafficking or child pornography unless you shut down adult pornography as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess we've already talked about, I mean, it's a lot of money involved there. You can get a lot of resistance from people uh, who are both in the business and people who are confused and or addicts who, you know, they want their mm-hmm. porn. Mm-hmm. Um do you do you really believe if you you know if if people did get together and ended pornography that that would have an incredible impact on uh, child abuse, child pornography, and uh, child sexual abuse? Oh, absolutely, sure. And you know why don't we do a moratorium and let's just have all the pornographers shut down their systems and stop producing for about two years and let's see what happens. I'm willing to do that. Um, you know they've made enough profit. Why not? Uh, you know, why shouldn't uh, the Playboy shut down for two years? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see what happens. No, but, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, it, once a society condemns the material appropriately, and once men feel embarrassed again, by the way, I should say, men are still very embarrassed. You, you still don't go into the public with a Playboy magazine. Forget all the rest of it. People still do not display these things in the public sphere. And you have to ask yourself, why not? I mean, when you go in, wherever you go, you see people reading Time magazine, you know, whatever magazine is is out there. But you certainly don't see people reading pornographic materials, or even like, quote-unquote, Playboy in a, in, a, in a public place. And Playboy did some research themselves, actually, on men on a man walking around with a Playboy magazine, and people look at him like he's a pervert because he's going to be a pervert if he's carrying that around. So, yeah, uh, if you besmirch, that's where Playboy broke was the, the gateway drug. If you besmirch the material from its origin, yes, you will over you will see a massive decrease in child sexual abuse, especially if you start arresting people and making it clear and doing so good, strong lawsuits so that you can raise the consciousness of the public and let them know how they get tricked into this, how they got manipulated and conned into destroying themselves and their society. Wow. (laughs) Again, uh, I think I have learned a lot uh, today. Um, The book, Sexual Sabotage, How One Mad Scientist, Unleashed a Plague of Corruption and Contagion on America. Uh, the website, uh, www. Doctor, excuse me, www. Dr. Judith Reisman. Dot com, R-E-I-S-M-A-N. Dot com or dot org. Or dot org, right. <laughs> Thoroughly enjoyed the program. Uh, I'm just Again, super grateful you were willing to spend a little bit of your Tuesday evening with us, and uh, I hope it was a constructive investment of your time. Well, you tell those people out there buy my book. <laughs> I mean, outside of it being great to talk about these things that I've worked on for so many years, the, whole, the bottom line is this is not entertainment, folks. And the, if I wanted to entertain, I could still be playing the guitar. And so, and I could get paid very well for that, well, in the old days. And so I really need you to show that it made a difference by going out there, getting the book, and then getting copies for your friends, your family, your church. Uh, it's, it's okay. There's nothing really bad in there that, you know, can't be shown to your church. Not little kitties, but teenagers. Mm. It's okay. All right? Will do. Get the book, Sexual Sabotage by Dr. Judith A. Reisman. Thank you so much, and uh, we will definitely be in touch soon. 
Thank you so much. I, you were really well read, I have to tell you. Uh, I try. I try to, you know, if you're going to share your time with us, I at least try to make sure I do my homework. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Gus T. Renegade, context of white supremacy. Uh, I will let folks know up front I had planned from the very beginning to not use the term white supremacy for the program because uh, I'm going to make an effort uh, if you didn't hear from previous broadcasts, I have two shows now, uh, Context of White Supremacy Here, uh, and a week from today, broadcast number one on uh, Irritated Genes Network, uh, War on the Horizon. Uh, they do have their own radio network, and I will have a program there once a week, every Tuesday, at uh, same show time as today, actually, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. So my plan was to do the program here and then to see if I can get her back on the program but do it over there because uh, I think Irritated Jimmy and the gang would be very appreciative uh, of her information. Uh, Nambla, anybody who's been listening, I know you've heard Irritated Jimmy bring that up before. Um, she has a whole article on her site that talks about um, child sex rights. Same thing Irritated Jean talked about. She has that information on her site, how all of this came from uh, Alfred Kinsey, uh, and I believe he began his career as a zoologist. Nutty white people. Um, at any rate, uh, what I would like people to do, if you're listening to this broadcast at Blog Talk Radio, take a moment. Uh, if you're listening on the show page, you're not able to see the full image. Take a moment and just think about what you heard on this broadcast and look at those images that are flashing by on the screen. I'm actually going to going to take 20 seconds so you can see them all flash by and just think about what you heard over the last hour 40 minutes. Okie dokie. Uh, for folks who are not at Blog Talk Radio, uh, or and even for people at Blog Talk Radio who might not know who everybody pictured is, I'll, I'll go ahead and give you the roll call so you can uh, put names and faces with these folks in case you need to do uh, more research. Uh, so I'm just going to start where I am. Venus Williams in her tennis outfit, uh, the infamous R. Kelly, uh, Montana Fishburne just did the pornography video, Lawrence Fishburne's daughter, Little Kim. Uh, we got Janet Jackson from the Super Bowl being molested by Justin Timberlake, suspected racist, 50 Cent. Uh, we got a shot from Monsters Ball with Halle Berry and Billy Bob Thornton, Kobe Bryant when he was accused of uh, raping a white woman. Uh, we got Eddie Long, uh, Eddie Long, uh, and I missed one. What was the photo I missed? Josephine Baker. Josephine Baker. White people, I said this before the program. Uh, if this program is constructive, you should be able to easily connect those images with the information that Dr. Reisman shared. Um, my view, white people are really doing a job on black people in degrading us sexually. Um, in my view, of all of these images that are flashing across the screen, uh, this is the result of socially engineered sexual deviance that will have an extraordinary impact on maintaining the system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, look at these images. I said before the program, I believe that black people, we lack sexual Discipline. I could be incorrect, but uh, there's a reason. Uh, if you want to go all the way back, she talked about Planned Parenthood extensively. Uh, we've had guests on this program before who have shared Planned Parenthood is no friend to black people. Um, if you go all the way back uh, in December when Mark Crutcher was here, he is the white person, uh, executive director of Mafa 21, uh, there is a reason that since 1973, abortion has killed more black people than AIDS, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and violent crime combined. 
I believe the reason is racism, white supremacy, and specifically, I believe the reason that that gruesome figure, and it could be incorrect, white people do lie, so it might not be true, but I suspect that I have reason to believe that that might be accurate. But if that statistic is accurate, I believe that the same thing that's causing that statistic and the number of murdered black children is the same reason why you have R. Kelly, Montana Fishburne, Kobe Bryant being accused of rape, Eddie Long, racist man and racist woman encourage and promote sexual deviance. That's what they do. It helps maintain their system. Uh, tons of folks have come on this program and shared that. Uh, I think it would be incredibly constructive if non-white people, black people, uh, could be much more disciplined with regards to sex. Um, a lot of the things that she said, I mean, prudish, very prudish, not having sex until marriage and all this other stuff, but you know, system dominated by racism, white supremacy, if being liberated, what they say, sexually liberated, these images, if this is going to be the result of being so-called sexual liberated under a system of white supremacy, I'd rather be approved. I would rather be approved. If R. Kelly, Eddie Long, Montana Fishburne, Little Kim, if this is going to be sexual liberation under racism, white supremacy, I would much rather be approved and say, hey, let's not get married. Let's not have sex until we get married. Uh, all of that. Let's let's be proud to be virgin. All of that. I would much rather go that route. If we're under a system of racism, white supremacy, I would much rather try that than to have this sort of foolishness continue. I could be wrong. I know some folks don't believe that uh, that black people lack sexual discipline. I could be wrong, but my observation it's a big problem. It's why we can't st- it's why we can't stay out of the bedroom with white people. It's why the abortion figures are so high. It's why Eddie Long. It's why R. Kelly. The list goes on and on and on. I believe our our, our lack of discipline sexually is one of our big big problems to replacing white supremacy with justice immediately. Think about it. Come to your own conclusion. At any rate, uh, quick notes. Uh, Sunday, very important program on Sunday. Eddie Long's situation, um, I can't say I've been following it a lot, but I have, you know, read some reports. I've been reading a lot of the the articles on CNN uh, because uh, Mr. Eddie Long is in Atlanta, Georgia, and CNN is in Atlanta, Georgia. For people who do not know Eddie Long, black male, uh, he has been uh, accused of uh, engaging in, uh, it would be pedophilia uh, because four different black males have made allegations that he uh, sexually abused them while they were minors. They were under the age of 18. In Georgia, the age, <laughs> the lowered age of uh, consent is 16, and I believe most of these black males were 17 or somewhere in there, but uh, they were 16 and up, at least from the reports that I've seen. Um, but at any rate, uh, he's facing those allegations, and they're still waiting to see what's going to happen. Um, there is a black male. His name is Shane Lee. Um, he was on CNN three times this past weekend talking about the Eddie Long case. He wrote an article that's on CNN.com right now, Shane Lee. It's S-H-Y-N-E Lee. Um, he was on Good Morning America on Monday of this week, Monday, September 27th. He was on Good Morning America talking about the Eddie Lee case, uh, excuse me, the Eddie Long case. Uh, he's going to be on the context of white supremacy this Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Pacific. Uh, he is a professor at Tulane, and he loves Tim Wise. Should be very interesting. I'm excited, looking forward to it. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to be chatting about the Eddie Long thing and, and all that good stuff. I, I have some suspicion that he might be so-called homosexual. We will investigate that for Sunday. But I'm very much looking forward to that, and I'm looking to bring my A game. Should be uh, should be a very constructive and important broadcast this Sunday. Shane Lee, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. Um, we will actually be back before then. We have a program on Friday, uh, Friday, October 1st. Uh, Zara Ali, she has her own program here, at Blog Talk Radio. She's called in before. She's an investor, actually. 
Uh, she'll be here on Friday. We'll be talking about uh, self-worth, uh, the importance of having a value uh, on yourself and what you do. Uh, really looking forward to having her on the program. She's very informed and a big-time supporter. That'll be uh, this Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, and 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, this Friday, Zara Ali, on the context of white supremacy. Uh, I think those actually are all the notes that I had for the program. Um, I'm a little tired today. I don't think I'm doing any chat time today. We have a full phone line, and I think I'm going to uh, to bail and uh, go go relax and put my feet up. However, uh, Aisha Segnet, two-time guest here in the context of white supremacy, she did a song about what happened with Eddie Long. Oh, man, oh, man, it is incredible. you got to check it out. I'm going to play it for you all as we uh, ride out. I'm not doing any overtime today. As we ride out, uh, you got to check this song out. Incredible. We'll be back on Friday, Friday, August 1st, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, please invest. If you think the program is constructive, um, if you do not think the program is constructive, that's no problem either. Um, find something more constructive to do with your time and energy. Uh, yeah, other than that, thank you. I hope the broadcast was constructive. Look at those images. Look at those images. Very important. Thank you for supporting the program. We'll be back uh, this Friday. Context of white supremacy. Replace white supremacy with justice as soon as